All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, like I mentioned, I was gonna start doing live interviews uh, once I got past 10K, but I'm getting ready to go into fucking surgery here pretty soon, so I wanted to sit down with a good buddy of mine, uh, kind of introduce him to you guys so you guys know exactly who he is. Um, he's also gonna be doing some stuff on the channel. So this is my very first one. Um, let me know what you guys think about it, all right, and then we'll go from there. So without further ado, guys, I wanna introduce you guys to AK. He'll give you guys a quick overview on uh, his career, where he's from, so on and so forth, and then we'll uh, move from there, all right? So AK. What's going on, guys? AK, uh, my name is Evgeny Kroshlov, no one could say it. Uh, so I got uh, dubbed AK uh, once I finally made it to regiment. Um, yeah, so I was, uh, I was born in Russia, um, moved to the States when I was five, and uh, moved to New Jersey. Uh, but, you know, from a young age, I always knew, you know, that the military was something that I wanted, you know, in my life. Um, coming from Russia, it's mandatory, you know, mandatory service is, uh, is for every male, you know, from yeah. the ages of 18. Um, so I, I always had that in the back of my mind. Um, but, you know, moving to the States was kind of chaotic, you know, coming from Russia uh, to New Jersey. Um, and growing up, we came here with, with nothing, you know. Uh, so my parents did what they had to do. Uh, but with that being said, it was kind of born into chaos, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, you know, at the end of the day, that's what attracts us to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, th those are yeah. the people that are going to go to that job. Um, yeah, I joined the army when I was at, uh, 18 years old. Um, and, uh, my recruiter showed me this awesome video for 13 <laughs> Delta. Um, <laughs> it looked awesome. You know? Yeah. 13 yeah. Delta field, field artillery, you know, yeah. uh, and you're not the fister, you're not the Fox, um, out there with the, with the grunts, you know, on the front. Um, no, you're the guy that they send the coordinates to. Oh, nice. You yeah. just sit there and oh, you then... just and then you punch in those coordinates and then somebody else gets to have all the fun. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, you know. we'll, we'll go back to the beginning real quick. We'll digest like uh, the initial, you coming to the States. At what age did you did you and your family move to the US from from Russia? So I was five years old. Five yeah. years old? Yeah, we moved okay. from Moscow to New Jersey. Okay, I got you, yeah, because I moved um, from, from Haiti to the States around 10 years old. And now, when you moved over here, did you already speak English, or did you have to learn how to speak no, English? No, speak English at all, <laughs> not at all. My parents didn't either, you know. So uh, it's I, I'm trying to learn English, yeah, but also trying to remember Russian. Yeah. So it was yeah. just a complete back and forth in the house, uh, you know. As but luckily for me, you learned a lot quicker yeah. at a young age. Yeah. For my parents, it was a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, uh, now. When it comes to uh, uh, moving to the States and learning English, now were your folks strict as far as they wanted you to stick to like the Russian culture, but also adapt like the US culture at the same time? Yeah. Were you, like I mean, a split household where, hey, we're still Russian, but I want you to learn this, this, this new upbringing and this uh, new way of life, essentially? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to adapt, uh, assimilate, you know, to the American way of life, but it's kind of hard. It was completely, yeah. it's, it's night and day, you know, yeah. uh, Soviet Russia compared to America, you know, the yeah. land of the free, uh, it's completely different way of life, especially in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in, in some ways, you know, we held on to, uh, in the Russian way of life, yeah. you know? Um, but it was more my grandparents, okay. um, that, uh, that kind of gave me that peace, you know? Okay. Um, and with my parents, you know, coming here with nothing, they, they, were, my dad was going to school mm -hmm. um, at night and uh, working two jobs. So I was pretty much raised by my grand grandparents. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was it, it took a while for them to to kind of really fully adapt. Yeah. You know, um, it was it probably wasn't until my sister was born. Um, but you know my my father a lot more so he uh you know he kind of dove in yeah dove into it. my mother's still kind of um holding on i think to um yeah. russia to russia yeah, yeah. just uh i think it's the, the language yeah. you know the the language barriers is, is the hardest part you know um 
my dad went to school, like I said, at night, so he, he kind of learned English a lot quicker, yeah. and, uh, you know, he adapted. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, I always talk on this channel how SF is comprised mostly of, you know, like, not necessarily immigrants, but folks that are, that have, like, hard upbringings. Yeah. Because we're, we're tested when it comes to adversity, um, and we're stronger minded like i'm not saying that all the other folks that didn't go through adversity um they're not you know like strong-minded but when you think of it like if i'm born with a silver spoon in my mouth yeah i might dabble in like the army but why would i go through hell and back you know what i mean when i have everything else on the other side you're already comfortable yeah and exactly exactly so i always joke on this channel like hey like poor people that's who makes up majority of the military. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And you might have a couple of folks dabble here and there just to be patriotic, you know, but at the end of the day, like, where who makes up the military? And yeah. there's a shit ton of immigrant in it, too. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to military, you mentioned that in Russia, like, it's mandatory. Did your dad serve in Russia? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so my dad served, you know, my grandfather, yeah. um, every male in my family. Um, yeah. My great grandfather was actually a surgeon. Um, he ran all the field hospitals okay. in uh, World War Two. Mm -hmm. So in Stalingrad, oh, nice. he was running all of the hospitals oh, nice. on the Russian front. Um, yeah, I mean, my my dad's view still was that if I don't have to do the military, don't do it. You yeah. know, he's yeah. an architect. Um, yeah. My family's all engineers, mm -hmm. artists. Uh, you know architect yeah <laughs> so so when I when I said I want to join the army it was yeah. you know it was frowned upon yeah you know yeah. Um, there you don't have a choice yeah whereas so he he just wanted you to I guess go a different route because they were made to do it in Russia so his perspective was well why are you gonna do it here when you have options yeah yeah he wanted me to go to school he wanted me to be an architect also because yeah. um, yeah. it wasn't my path you know yeah so um, what I guess that'll lead us into our first question, which is like, what made you want to join the military? So you guys migrated from Russia to the States, you're learning English, you're going to school, and then at what point did you know that you wanted to join the, the military, and why? I Like I said, I've always wanted to join, yeah. you know, ever since I was a kid. Um, you know, if you uh, look back through like, stuff that you have from grade school um they ask you what you want to be when you grow up you know yeah. my mind was always a soldier um yeah. but uh I, I started getting guided more in that direction mm -hmm. the older i got because so i was kind of born into chaos mm -hmm. uh and that's kind of what i lived in you know yeah. um yeah you know growing up how we did with yeah. no money uh i always wanted to have everything of the yeah. american dream yeah. um and uh, uh, the older I got, the military just seemed like a, the right yeah. choice. Yeah, know? like a fast track to to success. <laughs> to success and <laughs> yeah. a way out, you yeah. know, to, to travel, to, yeah. you know, they, they sell you, a, they sell it real well, you yeah. know, um, see the world. Yeah, because <laughs> I also joke, well, I guess not necessarily joke, but I tell folks on this channel also, folks that come from, you know, our, our background, whether it's... Um, uh, New York City or Detroit or New Jersey, I was joking. I'm like, hey, the military is the only place that you can go where within one generation you can switch things around. You can go from, you know, growing up in the slums to owning properties to traveling the world to yeah. getting paid on a regular College basis degrees. to retire. Yeah, yeah, degrees, retirement. Like the military is one of the only places that I know of that you can do that. And it's super fucking easy. Like you literally show up, they tell you what to do, they tell you how to do it. And then you just do those and you're fine. Yeah. Um, so at, at, at what age did you join? Was it 18, 19? I joined in 19. Okay. Um, so I, I, I was getting in trouble a lot uh, <laughs> as a kid, you know? Um, so I tried to join at 18, but it, yeah. took, a, it took a little while okay, um, to get you. in there. Um, yeah, so I went to a, a basic training in Fort Sill. Um, okay. So I became a 13 Delta. How was basic um, training? Because when I went, it was weird, man, because being from... You know, like a like a impoverished background, like that shit was nice. Aside from you know Sean with other dudes, like it was like a fucking cakewalk. But then while I was there, like there was like grown men that's never been away from home, 
like just struggling. Suck. Yeah. Struggling. Yeah. 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 So how was your basic training? I it wasn't too bad. Um being from up north, you know, like you're from New York. Um, I found a couple of people from uh, yeah. Chicago, Flint, yeah. you know, New York City. Uh, we kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, we we uh, we hung out, it, but uh, no, it was good. Um, it definitely wasn't what I expected, you yeah. know. Um, so? so I didn't I didn't go as an eleven Bravo, yeah. right? Um, going to Fort Sill, it's it, it's a lot different, you yeah. know. Um, uh, physically, I wasn't where I wanted to be, right? So I worked on myself a lot there. Yeah. Um, but you know, I just I thought it'd be a lot harder. You know, yeah. I, I thought it'd be like like in the movies. You know, like, real sorry <laughs> well, you going after. <laughs> well, um, you say it was maybe it wasn't harder f- for us, right? Because again, we grew up like working out in the struggles, you know, down there getting it. But I'm sure there was some folks in your basic training class that were like, oh my God, this is hard. I'm like, dude, this is, it's 30 push-ups. Yeah. Like, it's not fucking hard. You just got to fucking do it. But I'm sure there was those dudes all all over the fucking place. Um, so you got done with basic. Was AIT at the same location or did you have to go somewhere else? AIT was the same location. Okay. Um, and that that's when I realized that I, this isn't for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, this job is not for me. Like, I, I, yeah. I could do it will not be happy yeah. you know um so i mean i got through it yeah. you know um it wasn't difficult you know yeah. a lot of uh plotting points yeah you know? yeah that yeah. doesn't sound fun at all no um, no it wasn't for me um yeah. and then i went to fort silt that was my first duty station um that's right there next to fort riley yep yeah so basic ait <laughs> first duty station okay and i started seeing the world real quick yeah <laughs> traveling yeah oklahoma nice. um yeah but that um, that's when I <laughs> probably the the first week of being there, um, I started looking for a new job. You know, okay. mentally, I started yeah. trying to figure out what what, what else I could do, where I could mm-hmm. go. You know, um, so I showed up there, and you know, you you think the military, you think everyone's in shape. You know, no, no, like that's not the case at all. Yeah, yeah. especially <laughs> for it still. You know, like the standard was yeah. low. Um, I showed up and there were so many people that said they had thyroid problems. They're on soft shoe profiles yeah. for thyroid problems, eating a donut, you know? And it's like, it's not a thyroid problem, it's a Krispy Kreme problem, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but just seeing that, you know, if there was one or two throughout the battalion or the company, it would have been one thing. Um, but just seeing how low the standard was. Um, made you want to go do something else. It made me want to go, yeah. yeah. Um, and I had a... A staff sergeant or a staff sergeant green um he's from new jersey also um probably the most physically fit guy i'd ever seen up to that point you know um just very disciplined um and he told me he was thinking about going to selection so within a- so leading up to that point did you know anything about special forces because i know there's the, what when when was this 2000 and uh, it was 2010, 2010. I got there, yeah. So I joined No. 9. Yeah. So before then, of course, Rambo was a thing, and there might have been a couple of other, like, Special Forces-related movies out there. You had the SEALs always doing shit. Uh, now, did you know about Selection or Special Forces leading up to that point, or was it that E6 no, that, that, that kind of shined some light on it? I knew nothing about it. Um, yeah. You know, I, obviously, I, everyone's heard of Green Bay. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like you said, uh but no, I, I didn't really know much about it. I didn't know that it would be not that easy to, to volunteer to go, you know, but yeah. just that it's such a streamlined process, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I needed to be in E4, right? Okay. So I, 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 I was fresh in. Um, I got there as an E2. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just started training, you know? Yeah. Uh, I started training with him and uh, one of his buddies um, and just started trying to research, you know? I got a... Yeah. The SFAS prep book. Yeah. Um, How was that helpful? Selected. <laughs> I mean, being in Fort Sill, like you, seeing, uh, we had one guy with a Ranger chat, major, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone else, they had been there, they had been at Bliss, you know. Like they, so there wasn't a lot of knowledge. Okay. There, there wasn't a lot of people that uh, were able to give me their input mm-hmm. um, or any guidance, you know. Um, and on top of that, it being in, in field artillery, we, we never did land navigation. Okay. We didn't really do that much 
physical training, right? We do PT in the mornings, um, you know, and some ruck marches, stuff like that. But that was pretty much it. Our field problems, we slept in, you know, GP mediums. Um, <laughs> living and, a good life. Huh? Yeah, yeah, Not living a good cool. life. <laughs> yeah. So you found out, you know, selection existed, and now you're starting to train for it. Um, at this point, are you still in contact with your family up in New Jersey? You told them, hey, I just got here. It sucks. I'm thinking about joining Special Forces. What was, the, what was their reaction then? Was it still, hey, do whatever you need to do? Or was it, hey, we want you to come out, do a couple of years, come out, and then go back to school? Or how was that? No, I mean, at that point, they, my dad was supportive. My mother was never supportive of the military at all. You know, my dad was kind of like, just confused. Yeah. He's like, you made it to America. You don't have to do this. Why, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but my mother was fully against it, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, for my dad, he 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 saw that uh, it's it's a better job, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's somewhere where I'm going to be able to grow, learn, and uh, on top of that, be surrounded by you know the the best guys yeah. that that I I can, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so he they were supportive, um, and on top of that. Uh, my wife at the time, uh, she was pregnant too, right? Yeah. So um, I knew that, and they knew that that this was the way that I would be able to get a also better financial stability, yeah. you know, yeah. um, be able to progress in my career, mm -hmm. um, and also be able to get my resume built up, right? Yeah. Be, be able to get a good job uh, when I get out with that as in my background. Um, because coming from FA, I wouldn't have. No, no, you're not getting a job with anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, they, they were. Yeah. You know, they were indifferent. Yeah. Um, and that's good because I always tell dudes on this channel that hey, before you go do anything, you want to make sure you have your entire support staff behind you. That being your, your parents, your wife, your kids. Because if you don't, and you go off to selection, and while you're there, you're thinking about shit that's going on back home. You're thinking about not having everybody behind you as soon as you get kicked in the balls you're gonna fucking crumble essentially right yeah. um so you made up your mind uh you decided to go now talk me through like gt score uh physical prep and mental prep did you have all the blocks checked off that you needed to actually go to selection and not crush it uh so yeah my gt score was good um my rank was one of, well, you know one of the yeah. things that was holding me up um language i already knew russian yeah. right um so my D-Live was good to go. Um, physically, um, you never know if you're, yeah. if you're fit enough, yeah. you know? You, yeah. you, you always think that, and rightfully so, that, that you know you have to do some more work, right? But yeah. at a certain point, enough is enough, right? You yeah. have to just try and do it. Um, the biggest thing that worried me was like land navigation, mm -hmm. um, you know, anything tactical. Yeah. I, so um, how'd you prep for land nav then? <laughs> I uh, got that book, got a Ranger Handbook, <laughs> <laughs> you know, watch some videos. Um, I go out to the mountains, uh, the one mountain range near Fort Sill, um, on the weekends, and, and I would try and try and land that, you know. Okay. Um, and I would do that every single weekend. Um, Leading all the way up to selection. Yeah. I, I stopped a couple weeks prior. Okay. Um, it was, uh, a couple weeks right I got uh, I got chased by a bunch of wild hogs out there right <laughs> so uh, I, I figured I should stop b yeah. before I don't even make it the selection yeah. Um, yeah that that was my biggest concern going mm -hmm. into it obviously the unknown not knowing yeah. much about it um, but uh, looking up to those uh, two NCOs mm -hmm. you know as a junior guy I I was just falling you know yeah. I was like a puppy I was like you're going to selection I'm going too now you know? that like, Danny Six did he go to selection and did he end up getting selected no so i went with two uh the three of us went at the same time right yeah. um he had uh, an issue with his wife okay so he didn't make it out of the barracks oh, okay prior yeah. to going there you go right <laughs> so he made it to brag and then that was it um and then his friend didn't make it past the gates okay right um so coming okay. back it was kind of funny yeah uh, they're like you. Yeah. You, yeah. Out, of, out, of, out of the three of them, you, yeah. you're the one that came back. <laughs> I had a similar story that I was telling my channel. Like, I stumbled on SF because my squad leader, and he's six, uh, he went to selection. He didn't get picked up. And 
I started picking his brain, like, hey, what is this selection stuff? And then he told me about it. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And I just went and I yep. got picked up. So I still give him shit till this day. How, how um, was your prep for that? It, it was non-existent, man. Like, cause I was in shape, just like you. I was worried about land nav. So I did a bunch of land nav stuff at Fort Riley, Kansas. And it was just, hey, I found a map. Uh, I, I got that book, um, Get Selected. Get Selected, yeah, I that read was the through one. it, and I just kind of figured out Land Nav, but I, I really learned Land Nav at Selection. Yeah. But similar to you growing up in New York City, there was no Land Navigation. I got on the bus, and I waited till they tell me to get off. <laughs> that was the extent of it. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's always funny, because till this day, like I still stay in touch with that um, uh, squad leader. Uh, I don't give him shit anymore, but it's... I, I'm still thankful because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be here because I would have never known what it was because we were too busy deploying and doing uh, rock clearance and all that shit. But having him go kind of planted that seed that led me to selection. Oh, yeah. No, I'm um, eternally grateful yeah. for, for those two guys. You yeah. Know, for some yeah. Green. Um, so yes. now, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, let's talk through selection. So you got to selection. Um how was the first week? The first week being gate week, right? How was that for you? That wasn't bad, you know? Okay. Like I said, I was physically fit, young, you yeah. know? You're unbreakable at that point. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think I going into it, I had the most important thing, which was just like that no fail. Like I yeah. knew I needed a change. Um, and that's what I set my mind to, right? So, yeah. so going in with that mindset, um, that no fail, um, yeah, week one wasn't, wasn't bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's funny you say that mindset of no fail because, again, when these guys uh, ping me, you know, on the channel wanting to know how to build their mindset and want to know how to, you know, achieve that no fail mindset, a lot of them approach me with, hey, um, this is my plan B. Like, I'm ready for selection. Like, hey, if selection doesn't work out, do you think it's good for me to go to Ranger Bat? And I'm like, dude, like, why the fuck are you talking to me about you failing already? Yeah. Like, all you're doing, failed. yeah, is speaking That's... that into existence. Yeah. And I always tell them, like, don't plan an exit route. You know, just attend selection and know that you're going to crush it. Yeah. If something happens and you get hurt, that's different. But if you already have a plan B in place and you don't have that no fail mentality, like, you're planning to fail yeah. because oh, yeah. you already know you have a nice cushy spot wherever the fuck before you even go. Yeah. And I try beating it into these dudes like, hey, in order to go to selection and succeed, like you gotta have that no fail mindset. Yeah. Um, so I hopefully these guys watching this will hear it and it'll get stuck into their brains and they'll actually um, start creating a plan to actually get selected as opposed to, oh, if this doesn't happen, at least I have this. Because as soon as it gets hard, you, your, your mind's going to start fucking with you. Like, hey, why are you out here when you got this win for you at the house? You yeah. know what I mean? Um, so you got past week one. How big was your selection class? I was. Pr it was pretty big. Okay. It was pretty big. Um, 200, 243 okay. people, 244 people. Now, do you remember how much you guys lost at the end of week one? I don't remember how many we lost uh, by the end of week one. Um, I know towards the end. Okay, you know, I, got you. We were at. I got you. Um, but I mean, it's it's crazy how many you do. You know, I, I yeah. remember it, it wasn't a few. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. guys go in there and they're just not ready at all. Mm -hmm. You know, they they can't do a single pull up. Yeah. You know, they can't pass a two mile run. Um, so yeah, the attrition rate was pretty high. Um, but I, you know, I went I went during the perfect time of year. I went okay. in September. September. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I so, went in April. It's fucking cold. Um, better than July. <laughs> <laughs> now, so so you got done with, with week one, and then you moved on to week two, which is Land Nav, which gets majority of the class. Uh, how was Land Nav for you? Did you guys do the star at selection, or did you um, uh, skip it and do it at SUT? Because I know around that time, like, I started, they um, try that. No, no. So we did the star there. Okay. Um, that was that was definitely my hardest week, you know, okay. as far as uh, uh, not physically, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was a, uh, you know, like so just like you, I learned land nav while I was there. Yeah, you know, I I, I kind of dabbled in it. Yeah, pretty much at Fort Sill, um, but 
I got kind of confident, you know, yeah. in, in the couple of days of prep that they give you. Mm -hmm. um, but then once we did the star, the first day, I just bowled it. <laughs> Completely bowled it. Um, they had just done the controlled burns, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, I had started uh, about halfway um, up on the star, right? Yeah. And my first point was way up north. I completely overshot. Um, <laughs> I and I just kept walking. You yeah. know, I kept thinking You're that I would hit eventually. that road. <laughs> you know, that I'm looking for in my head, right? Um, and it just never hit it. You know, um, it took me half the night to, to pretty much get to my first point. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start getting frustrated. Yeah. Um, and disoriented and all that, and you lose your focus, yeah. that's when everything starts to crumble, yeah. you know? Um, especially not being comfortable with land navigation yeah. to begin with, not having that yeah. good base. Um, but uh, So how did you overcome that? Because at this point, I know a lot of guys that's not comfortable with it, they'll probably self, I guess, deselect, right? Like, hey, I'm not gonna make it. Yeah. I just literally just, fuck this up like and they'll and they'll just quit right there so how did you overcome that first experience what the first day give or take of land nav yeah how'd you overcome that and bounce back to where you were able to push through it and pass the start towards the end i mean so it was that night that i kind of figured you know i, I figured it out you yeah. know I, I i saw what i did wrong um and i corrected you know, um, it's just having that mindset, having that mindset that I'm not going to fail, yeah. right? Um, not allowing myself to be a victim of my mind, yeah. you know? Um, I just, I, I knew I had to figure it out, you know? So I was scrambling. I was, it was definitely frantic at some point, right? Yeah. Um, trying to, to, you know, so the star course is confusing. There's, yeah. they give you the map and yeah. there's, there's, we'll say there's 20 roads on it. Yeah. In reality, there's like 50, <laughs> you know, they are everywhere. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's very unexpected. Yeah. You know? Um, but I, I just, I got my bearings that night, you know, okay. um, I knew I had made that mistake, you know, I took it on the chin. Um, and I just, I was not going to give up the yeah. next day. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was not going to give up. Yeah. And that's a good mindset to have. <laughs> I, I just can't stop beating it into these fucking kids, man. And it's like this new generation, as soon as, you know, shit gets hard, they fucking give up. And I'm like, dude, like you have to figure this out before you get the selection. Yeah. Because it's meant to make you want to quit. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't go in there with that mindset, you're going to fucking quit. Um, so you got done with phase two. So now you did the store twice, right? Once at the beginning and then once towards the end. I, I think it was like a practice star, right? There's a practice one, and if you pass that one, you technically don't have to do the actual exam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you so I did the practice one, yeah. and then I had to do it the next day. I had to um, do the same thing. It's yeah. all right. <laughs> it's rough. Yeah, it's well, rough because your feet are torn up at that point. What is it like? Fifty something fucking miles. I think because it's I ten hours. The second day was yeah. it was about it was twenty. Something clicks, like 23, yeah. 24 clicks. But you did it twice, so that's double the amount of mileage on your yeah. fucking feet. Oh, you're yeah. done. Yeah. You are torn up. Yeah. You know, week one, you're fine because uh, you prep for that. You yeah. Know? You prep for that. You're doing those small gates, you yeah. know, um, and then you have time, uh, at least a little bit of time to recover. Yeah. Um, if you fail that practice one, there's not a lot of recovery time. No. You no, know, it's literally the next night. You, yeah. You fucking delight it again. Yeah. You, you um, grab a meal, and that's. You're going back out there, yeah. you know. Um, you know, but it was, it was at, at the end of that second day. Um, I had done pretty well. I had a lot of time left, and I had one point left to, yeah. uh, to reach. Nice. And it was across Scuba Road. Oh yeah, everybody um, knows the infamous Scuba Road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but see, I got, I got arrogant. Yeah. I got arrogant at that point, right? So don't skip Scuba Road. Yeah. You know, this is, this is going to be my. <laughs> The, the one lesson learned at the end of this, um, I thought I'd go around it. No. I was like, I got like four hours left. It's like a click and a half. I'll go around. <laughs> I looked at the map, you know, and, it, and to the northeast, uh, it looked like, you know, it would, it would be easy, easy yeah. going. It's not. It was all marshes. Oh, you know, I, I, I started going around, and it was, I, I, I probably made it with an hour left. Oh, shit. And I was just walking with water up to my belly, yeah. you know, 
vines and stuff, you know, at eye level. And it was yeah. miserable. As opposed Ooh. to just going through Scuba Road, you yeah. would have been... 20 minutes. Yeah. Done. Through it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> no. Had to get cocky, you know? Wanted to stay dry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've heard horror stories about Scuba Road. Like, I remember going through Scuba Road, um, and me, like... I just went through it because le leading up to the point, like I was walking through all, because I went in um, April, so the the creeks were starting to fill up. So I was drenched by the time I got to Scuba Road. So I didn't give a shit. I just walked through Scuba Road, um, and then I walked back. And, and I remember coming back across, and there was a kid standing there. He was naked as fuck. He was just naked. I'm like, what are you? Like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm going across the road. I want my clothes to get wet. Like, he got completely butt naked, dude. Like, held his rucksack on top of his head and walked through the road. And I was like, yeah, no, nah, I'm good. Um, so now, towards the end of selection, I mean, uh, uh, towards the end of um, week two, did you notice that the class was getting smaller and smaller? Because, again, land nav gets a lot of fucking dudes. Oh, land nav yeah. has been the herd. Yeah. It's been the herd. Um, yeah, we were probably at half. Okay. Now. It, it, it was getting quite small at that point, um, you know, because you, you get the guys that just didn't prepare at all yeah. out in week one. Um, week two really, you know, t takes the meat off of it, um, mm -hmm. and then you're left with the guys that, you know, a, a lot of them are going to, at that point, are going to make it through, yeah. you know, yeah. um, at least in my class. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was a... It was crazy to see the morale shift, though, because everyone yeah. was super nervous before land that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and it's a it's a huge weight lifted off your shoulders. Yeah. You know, as soon as you as soon as you know you passed that point. Yeah. Um, now you know you just don't suck for the last week and you yeah. should be fine. Don't suck. Take yeah. care of your feet. Yeah. You know, and, and just don't quit. Yeah. All right. Now moving on to uh, week three, which is uh, team week. Mm -hmm. um, for me, team week was probably my worst week because it brought out like some inner demons especially when it came to dudes feeling sorry for themselves and me not having the patience to deal with that stuff oh, like yeah. i almost screwed myself over because i was i want to say it was like the last mission and we were right around the corner and this dude just quit right then and there and i just i just lost it <laughs> like i i just lost my fucking mind to where the cadre had to speak with me and he was like, hey, do you think you're, you've you been giving it 100% throughout this entire... And I'm like, uh, I think so. Have I? You know, and then he walked away. So that fucked with my head a little bit. Um, but how was week two for you um, as far as team week? Uh, like I said, it brings out the inner demons. Yeah. You know, um, people are getting hurt at that point. Um, my feet were pretty messed up. Uh, my knee was kind of shot. Um I was just gritting my teeth, you yeah. know, trying to get through. Um, it was really frustrating though, because you know sometimes they pick, they put people in those leadership positions, mm -hmm. and they just lose their minds, yeah, completely. You know, get you get the class lost. <laughs> they start to try to build these apparatuses that yeah. just don't make sense, sense at all. You know, um, so it was it was frustrating. You know, um, and being from up north. Uh, you're pretty vocal, you yeah. know, it, you know, it's, it's hard to keep your cool sometimes. Um, but I just like being a younger guy, uh, I think it helped me out. If I had gone there as yeah. a more senior dude, I think I would have been a lot more vocal, um, and shown my frustration a little yeah. bit more, you know, but kind of being that junior guy, I, uh, kind of just held back, you know, and, uh, and just tried to see the guys that were doing the right thing. Right. Yeah. And just, just kind of tried to group myself with them, um, but uh, no. At that point, you start seeing right. So all the eighteen X rays, yeah, and the regular army guys, the guys who had done five ten deployments, right, mm -hmm. that are in their mid twenties, thirties. These X rays in the in the transition moves, right. So in, in between uh, in between uh, events, they're just taking off, yeah. running, you know, and they're yeah. still in such good shape. Um, and they're all bent. They were banded together. Yeah. Um, and that kind of messed with me a little bit because like those dudes were still crushing it. Yeah. You know. Um, and I, I mean, I was, I was just trying to keep going. You know, I was, yeah. I was hurting. Um, but no, I, I thought that was, it was a pretty good week. You learn a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you learn a lot about yourself, and you learn quickly how 
tight-knit of a team, you know, you yeah. can get if yeah. you have something to overcome, yeah. you know? Because um, you don't know any of these guys. You don't even know their names, you yeah. know? You're you all just know a number. number. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know? Um, but seeing everyone come together, it, for the most part, you mm -hmm. know, um, definitely points of friction. But uh, that was uh, what helped me get through it, yeah. you know? Nice. So, uh, yeah. How was it for you? Uh, so when I went through, I was senior E6. And again, aside from losing my cool towards the end, like, I didn't have an issue. It was just the body was starting to fall apart. And I always tell guys that uh, week three or team week, it's meant to get to the core of who you actually are because that's when shit really gets tough. Um, week one, everybody prep for. Week two, you can prep for, but you'll learn as you go there because you're out there for five days doing two PEs a day. So eventually, it's gonna click as long as you apply the stuff that they teach you. But week three, you can't really teach that because it's it's meant to bring out all your inner demons. It's meant to see how well you play with each other. Yeah. And um, I figured it out but there was a lot of guys that just couldn't hold it together. And if you don't go there with the intention of making friends, when it comes to pink and blues, like those dudes are gonna pair you out. Yeah. And there was a lot of that, um, but my class was somewhat uh, mixed. Like we had a decent amount of regular army dudes, we had a different amount of x-rays. Those dudes banded together, and then we kind of banded together also. But the x-rays, they were in shape, but they lack leadership skills yeah. so that's where we came in and the cadres did a really good job of mixing x-rays with officers with enlisted and then once those team came together um it actually worked out pretty good yeah. uh, so it wasn't too bad um so you got done with team week and now you guys are waiting for the decisions did you get boarded or were you just waiting to get the results at that point so in my class, they had uh, everyone. Everyone had to go through the board. Um, not not the board process, but uh, you sat you sat in the uh, auditorium. Yeah, yeah. And, you know they call you back. Yeah. Um, I did not get boarded. Okay, um, good. good. Just that that weight though. Yeah, it's dude, still agonizing. You know. That's <laughs> so for you guys that don't know, and I'm sure nobody knows because no one really speaks about this shit. So towards the end of selection, they they put everyone in this big room that's left and cadre goes up there and he starts dividing the group right he called hey roster number five outside roster number 20 outside like he he calls pretty much half of the class uh, there's a group outside and there's a group inside and you're sitting there like holy fuck like what group am i in um and i just remember sitting in the auditorium with and then them saying hey you guys are in here or you guys that are in here you guys made it and i just remember just feeling fucking relieved i felt accomplished you know i mean it was a pretty good fucking feeling oh the best feeling yeah you know you did, the army's pretty good with doing uh like ceremony stuff yeah. like that and that they're just like they just let you know you, you made it yeah you know? yeah um but that in itself is enough yeah. um yeah all of a sudden you just you feel every ache Every yeah. <laughs> how exhausted you are, you know, like yeah. it's just that mental, you know, your your guard goes down, yeah. um, and probably the, the one of the happiest moments of my life. Yeah, you know? yeah. Now, how many dudes did you guys actually get have get selected? We were at it was just under a hundred. Okay, yeah, because I think mine was seventy eight. I think it was right around eighty for my yeah. class and we started with like 320 man it was fucking ridiculous how because yeah. it was weird because you'll go like you'll go out for an event you'll come back and the tent just got like emptier and emptier yeah. and then by team week it was like we all knew each other because so many dudes have just you know left yeah. or whatever and some of those dudes that that were gone like doing the first week admin week i was like man these dudes are fucking monsters like they yeah. were like i thought i was fast and i was in shape but those dudes like put me to shame yeah and then week two came around and then week three and those dudes were just gone and i'm like what the fuck happened to them a lot um, of it's a roll of the dice yeah for some yeah, things you know yeah. you, you just you get unlucky yeah. um 
selection a lot of it is is luck you know um it's you know what, what points you get you know mm -hmm. what injuries you get mm -hmm. um, um so if you had any advice for um dudes going to selection um watching this right now whether it's x-rays or prior uh, service guys or guys that are currently um in the service uh, what what would that be based on your experience from when you went for selection, it would definitely be mindset, you know? The biggest thing would be mindset. Um, if you truly want it, um, then you're ready to go. You know, if you're unsure and you're trying to have all these secondary, tertiary plans, you know, that, that, that aren't just thoughts, you know, that you're actually formulating, you know, then, then you already failed. Um, other than that, it's, you know, land navigation, um, foot care, and, uh, Ruck packing. That's yeah. another thing I didn't know anything yeah. about. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, just the basics. You know, yeah. which they're all courses that I have in the Patreon. So go check that shit out. All right. So now let's transition from selection to the Q course. When you went through, what was the uh, um, breakdown of the Q course? Did you do SUT first, SEER, and then MOS and then language? Or language first. What was your layout? Okay. Yeah. So so we did language first, um, and then we did SUT. Um, MOS. Yeah. Um, did you go through language? So right. Seer before I say, I apologize. Okay. Um, yeah, I went through language school. So um, they tried to give me Spanish <laughs> when, I, when I was leaving selection, um, which, you know, it's kind of ironic. I, I looked at them. I was like, I have a tutu in Russian. Yeah. I have family in Russia, family all over Europe. <laughs> I'm a six foot four <laughs> white guy. And you want to send me to Spanish, oh. you know? Um, but I convinced them to give me Russian. Uh, yeah. But because I didn't know how to read yeah. and write. Um, Russian. Gotcha. I still had to go through the, uh, I still had to go through the uh, language course. Okay. Um, which is funny because at the end of it, they just make you take the OPI. <laughs> the OPI. You, know? you don't um, even take the DLP. No, you don't take it at all. Um, so yeah, I, I sat through language. Um, my uh, my teacher was also from Moscow. Nice. Um, she didn't let me talk most of the time. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, I, I worked on a college degree for oh, a lot nice. of it. Um, Why you were in language? Well, I was in language, you know. Um, once it got further along, more mm -hmm. advanced, um, I started participating more, but it, initially she just kind of wanted me to sit back. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then after that, uh, you know, we move forward, and you watch guys lose that skill set. Yeah, so quickly, so fast because it's not being practiced. So quick. Yeah. So you did language, and then was it SUT? I did SEER prior to. Okay, so SEER yeah. language. Yeah. SUT, and then and MOS. Then MOS. Yeah. And then Sage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, were there any challenges for you doing the Q course, or was it just hey, you sh you went straight through? Nothing uh, too too crazy. So in the Charlie course, um, I don't know if you remember uh, when this happened. We had a huge uh, huge delivery of uh, time fuse that mm -hmm. was completely expired. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, you 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 opened it up and the packaging was just rotted through. You mm -hmm. know, um, and uh, if you're doing if you're doing time fuse, it has to you have a plus or minus three seconds, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I know you were an instructor out there. Um, and dudes were getting like minus 20, oh, shit. plus 20, you know? Yeah. Um, and we were losing guys left and right. Um, and I got, I became one of those guys, mm -hmm. right? Um, the next day, a National Guard guy um, tried to get, they tried to drop him um, for, I think it was like minus 10 or something, yeah. uh, regardless. Yeah. Um, he called his chain of command. Yeah. And uh, they had the instructors, the cadre, do that, do it. Yep, yeah, and indeed, yeah. Every single one of them failed, you know, because they were yeah. looking at us like all of you are retarded. Yeah, you know, like like how are you guys messing up this bad? Um, so after him, everyone else got to continue. Yeah. Um, but all the guys that failed before so got recycled. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and. Uh, one of my uh, my buddy that uh, had gotten dropped with me, he was a he was a framer mm -hmm. prior to joining, right? Yeah. And uh, the cadre knew that, right? Yeah. So we got dropped. Everyone else got recycled. Yeah. Rolled back to the uh, captain the, place. Yeah. No. So they they had to start uh, day one. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. But 
for us, no, no, Cal can play, restart Cal can play, sorry. I gotcha. um, for us, they wanted him to do some work. Oh. So they were like, hey, <laughs> just just come out and work for us for a little bit, and we'll let you come back in the day, you know, yeah. uh, the day that you got dropped, oh, nice. right? So you won't have to miss anything. They completely lied to us. We were there for like two months <laughs> doing projects for them, right? And I'm, I didn't have a framing background. Yeah. I didn't have a construction background. I did demolition a little bit prior yeah. to joining. Um, but I was like 240. Yeah. So he was doing projects for him and I was just his mule. <laughs> just right? lifting heavy just shit. Lifting heavy <laughs> shit, you know? So I was just jacking steel, you know, <laughs> carrying wood, carrying lumber for him. Oh, um, man. But, um, but other than that, um, no issues, really. Um, definitely going into actually SEER and SUT. Um, I did them back to back um, right before Christmas. You leave. did SEER first? Sear first. Oh, I'm sorry, S U T and then Sear. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> S U T and then Sear. Yeah. Um, and the weight loss from that, you know, that was something that that messed me up. You know, yeah. um, doing Sear in December. Around around Fort Bragg, like there was absolutely no food. Yeah. Um, there was nothing. You know, yeah. so so we we everyone came back. 20, 30 pounds lighter. Yeah. You know? I think it's about the same for my class. I lost like 30 pounds with Syria. I was like 150 something. Yeah. Was, like, oh, I went up to Jersey afterwards and people were like looking at me like, you, you all right? And we thought you were going special forces, you know? You should have looking like a twig. Like, uh, um, no, just so just the recovery from that, you know, um, trying to get bound back. Yeah. Um, and then that little hiccup in, uh, in the Charlie course. Yeah. Um, which at the end of the day made a pretty good story. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey man, we yeah. gotta have people to work those projects, right? Yeah, that absolutely. shit has to get done. <laughs> and recycles or I work for. So it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um all right, so now you got pretty much done with the Q course. Um, so you started so it took you what, fourteen months, give or take? With the two months that you lost the Charlie course, yeah. or was it about yeah. okay. it's about fourteen months. Okay. Um yeah, I finished up um uh, I went to the summer uh, sage class, mm -hmm. um, and uh, once we finished, I found out my group, so I was going to the uh, first group, first with, battalion. With Russian. With, as a Russian speaker, yeah. <laughs> was, everyone went to third group, every Russian speaker, except me yeah. and one guy, this giant Viking-looking kid, <laughs> and me. They were like, we're gonna send you boys to Japan oh, um, nice. as Russian speakers. Nice. Um, but going to first group, uh, or Oconus, that mm -hmm. wait time, you know, to get your orders, um, it takes way longer. Right? Yeah. So I was just stuck there for a while, um, and I didn't get to leave until November. November. Yeah. Okay. So November of twelve, I went over and I, I got to Okinawa. Nice. Um, and I got attached to a C one one, so the SIF, the uh, it's a you know, or the counterterrorism DA direct action unit for first group. Um, and uh, that's actually the day the day I landed is the day I got my nickname. Nice. Um, yeah. So Pat Gilmore <laughs> picked me up. He was a he was an outgoing officer. He was a, he was kind of a legend out in uh, C one one, sponsored by Glock. You know, yeah. Beretta. Every, everyone. You know. Um, and he picks me up, my my wife and my kid, and doesn't really say much to me. You know, and I'm <laughs> brand new. You know, um, so I'm just super nervous. Brand new E five. Uh, we get in his car and he looks at me and he's like, "How the hell do I say your name?" You know, I'm like, oh, Sergeant um, Yevgeny Karashlov. He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, no. He's like, we're going to call you AK. He's like, don't F it up, you know? I was like, okay, Roger. You know, yeah, yeah, Roger. Yeah. And, that, and that stuck. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I went to C11 Open Now. It was an amazing place. Um, the best place I could have ever raised my son. Um, and the unit was was amazing, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I think showing up there as a brand new guy to the SIF, mm -hmm. um, it has, you know, it's, it's downfalls, right? Yeah. Uh, a, it's a lot more senior guys, um, historically. Yeah. I don't think nowadays. Um, but uh, also, I, I didn't really know how SF operated. Yeah. And, and yeah. showing up there, they have a lot more perks, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot more focused niche mission, doing mostly CQB flat mm -hmm. range, you know, kind of CT focused stuff. Um, so I never really know how to 
be a green beret, right? And, and that's a traditional aspect, yeah, right? Um, but uh, showing up there was, you know, being that new guy, yeah. Um, I was not the talk. You know, like, I wasn't allowed to talk for, for how, like, ask questions or talk. Like, you know, I'd ask something and they'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, go, well, that's, go that's, to... that's typical, like, new guy behavior, right? Like, as the new guy on the team, I think that's a Green Beret tradition that you actually got to experience, even though you weren't on a line or DA, as we like to call it, because um, typically for the SIF guys, a brand new guy shows up, you go on a line or DA, Get mm -hmm. some experience, and then you can go to the CIF or the CRIF, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the stuff that you experience as a new guy was still like goes on around the entire regiment. Oh yeah. So as the new guy, it's good to hear that they actually do that stuff over there. Too. Oh, they absolutely did. Because yeah. there weren't a lot of junior guys showing up there. Yeah. Right. Um, brand new guys. Yeah. Um, so the, the few of us that did show up, they made sure that you know. Yeah. We we felt it and. Uh, yeah, you learn a lot from that, yeah. though, you know, yeah. just sitting back, um, it it humbles you, yeah. for sure, you know, um, but, you know, as soon as I got there, it got, it got hot and heavy, uh, quick as far as um, the schedule, you yeah. know, the op tempo, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting how busy it is in regiment, you know, yeah. um, but uh, I showed up, I field artillery, right? from New Jersey. So I never grew up hunting. Yeah. I never grew up shooting really. I got to the army and I would qualify with 30 rounds yeah. every six months probably, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so going to my first pre-Sephardic, um, that was a, that, that was, that was an eye opener. Yeah. That was an eye opener. Um, my rifle wasn't bad. Um, I, you know, I, I bought an M4 in the Q course and uh, I would shoot on the weekends yeah. um, or in AR. But uh, day one, we're supposed to zero, right? And I know I can zero. I know I can shoot, right? Right? Yeah. Right? My pistol was terrible at that point, but I know I could, I know I can at least do this, shoot right? Gun, yeah. So I start trying to zero, and there's a round hitting here, there's a round <laughs> hitting here, right? So they're all over the place, like yeah. buckshot. Um, and as I just do another iteration, another iteration. I start getting this wolf pack around me. <laughs> it was it was eleven thirty one at the time, and they're standing around me like, like, what the fuck? And I'm telling them, I'm telling them, hey, this barrel shot out. Yeah, you know, there's something wrong with it, and they they are not believing me. <laughs> they are not believing me at all. Um, and I'm starting to sweat. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm like, I'm like doubting myself at a certain point. I'm like, maybe it is me. Maybe I'm just this fucking bad. Yeah. Um, and uh, at this point, I have the whole team surrounding me. Yeah. Pretty much right in there. Team sergeant comes over, and uh, he pulls his truck up, puts the hatchback. He's just sitting there. <laughs> he's just staring at me. And this dude looked like the Navy SEAL, right? <laughs> so he was an ex-combat diver, right? Yeah. He had the mustache, the thick, you know, just Hispanic dude, just jacked. <laughs> Terrifying, right? And he's looking at me like I am the worst person in the world, right? <laughs> and eventually the one older guy, uh, Red, on the, on their team, he comes up to me, and this guy sounded like Popeye. He's like, hey, he's like, give me that thing, you know? <laughs> give him my rifle. He gets down, shoots like three rounds. He's a like, barrel shot out. He's like, I've been trying. To I've been trying to. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to tell you. So I thought the rest of their team would be like, "Hey, man, you know, you were right." No, they all just walk away like nothing <laughs> happened, right? And they give me a new rifle and I yeah. zero. Um, now for uh, the audience, what's uh, pre-Sephardic or um, Sephardic as it, within itself? They probably don't know what that means. If you want to elaborate, so Sephardic is. Uh, Special Forces uh, Premier Direct Action School. Um, yeah. yeah, Direct Action School. Um, at the time, they would also teach more CT focused mm -hmm. right, tactics, um, and it's it's probably the best shooting school in the world. Yeah, you know, hands down. Um, in a, and pre-sephardic is just a precursor to that, right? It helps yeah. you get ready. 
That, so yeah. uh, pre-Sephardic will help you get past the flat range portion of, of Sephardic, okay. right? Um, so in, in Sephardic, you have a, you, you have your test after two weeks of the flat range, right? Mm -hmm. Of a flat range. Um, and that's where a lot of people start falling out, right? Yeah. Um, but up to that point, you're shooting, you'll shoot more in two weeks than people shoot in their lifetime. In you their know? fucking career. Yeah, yeah. career. You're yeah. shooting in your fingers. You know, there's the skins coming yeah. off, off, of your, uh, off your hand, you know, um, or the slides catching it. Um, so our pre sephardic was just, it was a ton of flat range, mm -hmm. ton of flat range. Um, for, and for me, it was a pistol was, was the biggest thing I had to work on. Yeah. And my anticipation was so bad. Yeah. So bad. You know, I, I was trying to throw that bullet out of the gun that my rounds would, would be hitting probably a foot, two foot lower, yeah. two feet lower than I, you know, I was trying to uh, aim. Um, but, you know, I, I did the first pre sephardic um, I had to go back to a second one. Uh, so you only get a, a limited number of slots to go, yeah. right, for each group to go over to, uh, to Sephardic. Um, and the progression was just, was amazing. You know, the, the amount that I learned in those, uh, if I had gone straight to Sephardic, there's no way, yeah. you know, I would have, no. I would have been able to be successful. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all just basic, right, uh, basic uh, combat, right, uh, co combat marksmanship. Um, with your M4 and, and your Glock. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I did that, and then I went to a Sephardic, um, and said, hands down the best school. You know, if, if guys out there are interested in being a shooter, um, you know, this is what you want to aspire to, to yeah. be able to get to, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you will be able to teach anyone you know, you, you'll have the fundamentals, the basics down, you know? And that's all they teach you there is is the basics, the basic, you know, yeah. the basics. And that's what people, you know, people think it's something sexy. No, they just teach you the basic stuff so you can get to your team or to the SIF. And then once you get there, your teammates and all the additional training that you're gonna do, that's what gets you to that next level operator. Yeah, essentially. yeah. Um, so you go to Sephardi, you're done with that. And then uh, you guys start running and gunning. So prior to going to SWIG, how was your career um, as a whole? Did you, was it everything that you expected it to be as far as Green Beret stuff or any issues? Yeah, um, so being in the SIF, uh, combat deployments weren't really a thing um, at, by the time I got there. Um, they were still doing Iraq rotations prior to me, me getting there, but those had died out. Um, so that's one thing that was frustrating, but you know, I, I ended up getting those later on yeah. in my career. But overall, um, it was it was everything I, I could have hoped for, yeah. you know? Um, as far as a military career goes, I, you know, deployed all over Asia, mm -hmm. you know, multiple times. Um, got to travel, I got to learn a lot. We worked with you know, kind yeah. of terrorism unit. Um, so it was great, you know, it was super busy. I was probably gone at least six months out of the year, yeah. right? So for family life, that's when you start seeing that impact, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially if you have kids, you know, you start, you start realizing that you're missing, you know, something yeah. huge, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but no, overall I was just, I'm super happy with, with the time that I had in regiment. Um, I, like I said, spent my time in Okinawa, and then um, I went over to um, Lewis, JBLM, mm -hmm. uh, where the other three battalions are for first group, and um, I got a couple Afghan rotations and a couple more J sets in, nice. um, and yeah, it was great. You know, I'm eternally grateful um, for it. Okay. Um, it was just, it's that that toll, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 uh, yeah. that grind that that yeah. starts kind of wearing you down a little bit. Um, but if I if I didn't have kids or family, it's something that I could do, you know, would want to do. For Forever, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, but just that repetitiveness of seeing, you know, my son grow up. Yeah, yeah, that um, shit gets old. That's <laughs> already getting old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you have any advice? We'll go back to the Q course. Do you have any advice for folks that are currently going to the Q course, and then also advice for folks that are getting ready to go to the regiment, uh, whether they're a new guy or they're currently in the regiment uh, before we transition uh, and. Uh, get to the end here stay humble 
Yeah. You know, you just got to stay humble, stay focused, um, especially when you get to that team. Mm -hmm. um, just try and grasp anything that you can, right? Yeah. Try, try and learn as much as you can because um, you're going to be on that team quick, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like yeah. The key course, it seems long while you're going through it, but in reality, you're going to, you're blinking. Yeah. And that's, that's it, over. you know? Um, no, just stay humble and, and, and absorb everything, yeah. you know? Um, but as far as when once you get to a team, you know, that and on top of just be cognizant of yourself, right? Don't forget to take care of yourself, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and your family. You know, like none of those, you can't get any of those back. Um, a big realization I had a couple of years in uh, to regiment, um, when I initially got there, I kept seeing the senior guys, you know, try and take off. Yeah. when they can to see the family, right? If we're not deployed, you know, if we don't have training going on and the newer guys would be there burning candlelight and it's absolutely, you know, like, I'm not saying don't work, but... You have to find that balance. Find that balance. Yeah. You yeah. have to find balance and yeah. that's something I wish I found earlier on in my career. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, now, fast forward, you're out of JBLM. Um, you went to SWIC because that's where I met you was at SWIC. Um, now, while you were at SWIG, I think you experienced everything that, you know, I experienced and everybody else in the regiment, right? You're going 100 miles an hour and then you hit that break and you're like, holy shit. Like, I know for me, I had a couple of surgeries. I had a couple of fucking, um, like sitting in front of, a, sitting in front of a computer. That shit was fucking horrible. Um, just cause I felt like I went from having this ridiculous purpose to now, um, I'm at SWIG. I'm towards the end of my career, and shit's just different. Um, now, I know why you were there. You went through some stuff, and then uh, you discovered um, operator syndrome, which is something that I've never fucking heard of until you brought it up to me. Um, please let the audience know exactly what operator syndrome is, the, um, the outlets that are available to them. Because, again, like, leading up to that point, like, I knew... It was a thing, but there wasn't a name attached to it yet. And I feel... Yeah, so operator syndrome, um, it's kind of just an all-encompassing term, right? Uh, it's every single thing that if you do this job that you're going to ignore while you're doing it, right? And at first, it'll start with one thing, maybe just TBIs, yeah. maybe depression, um, injuries, chronic pain, right? So for operator syndrome, it is when all of that comes to a head, right? Yeah. Um, especially for our job, we experience such higher levels of stress, right? Just chronic stress and um, elevated levels, right? Um, than, than regular people. And it's so constant that you get rewired um, to operate at this higher level, right? Mm -hmm. This higher op tempo. Um, so that combined with uh, TBI, depression, um, chronic pain, um, I have a list here, a few things. Um, sleep disturbance, obstructive sleep apnea, um, chronic joint pain, uh, substance abuse, depression, suicide, suicidal ideations, PTSD, um, existential issues, uh, so um, just having that identity crisis yeah. and trying to uh, figure out what, how to operate at a normal level, come to SWIC, yeah. you know, being yeah. job. Just getting out as a whole. Getting yeah. out as a whole, transitioning yeah. into civilian life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that I definitely experienced and I think you definitely yeah. you know, have to a, to a certain extent. You yeah. know, I think all of us have. Um, but all of that coming to a head. Um, coming to SWIC, I wasn't prepared for um, that change. I pretty yeah. much had an identity crisis yeah. coming out here. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, uh, personally, it was, a, it was kind of like a perfect storm. Like I'd gone through a divorce, had a couple of deployments, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of survivor's guilt, um, uh, some injuries, right? And then that combined with coming here, losing identity yeah. my identity you know and uh, my purpose right and 
that way of life. You know, I went from deploying six to 12 months a year to mm -hmm. being here every day working a nine to five, yeah. you know, office job. Um, that that was the perfect storm for me. Right? Yeah. Um, and everything came to a head. Yeah. Uh, and that's just something that guys have to be cognizant of, you know, yeah. that, and that's what I was saying before, you have to find that balance. Mm -hmm. You have to be um, aware of what your body's telling you mm -hmm. that it needs, you know, um, whether it's taking care of yourself physically or, or mentally, you know, yeah. um, or your family, because that's a huge part of it, you yeah. know. Um, my divorce, my kid moving away like that was huge for me because in, in for, for guys like us, I mean, for most people, you know, it's your family that's... Yeah, that's why you do it. That's you why you do it. Yeah. That's why you do this job, yeah. um, you know, and it's, you know, it, it, I didn't listen to my body. I thought I could keep going, you yeah. know, through, yeah. through all of it. Um, and then it just came to a head, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, guys just have to... Uh, just always be cognizant of that and, and don't be scared to reach out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, like I said, operator center is a, it's an all encompassing term for all of these, um, major, um, mental and physical, you know, issues yeah. that, that guys can have an existential marital, all that. Um, but I could have prevented a lot of it, you know, yeah, by, um, by getting the help up front, by getting the help up front yeah. and, and also by just, uh, you know, dividing my time, you know, for yeah. myself, Con concentrating also on yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a huge factor for guys going in, you know. I know that's yeah. why you run this channel, yeah. you know, it's to, to mentor guys. And they just have to kind of know that uh, there is a weight that's going to come with this job. Yeah, you know? there, there is a bad, like it's not just peachy, peachy, peachy. There's, like for every good, there's a bad. Right, yeah. just like if a cup is half full, it's also half empty. Like there's a yin and a yang. Like you gotta know this job is gonna have some type of effect on you. Um, and I know you went through a program. Could you tell a viewer um, where they can go for help if they if this is something that they they do experience or if there's something that they are having issues with? Because I know majority of the guys in the regiment do. Um, and I'm a big advocate of telling dudes like, hey, like if you need help, like be man enough to go get the fucking help. Like yeah. don't wait until it's too late or think that you're this, like you're weak if you choose to go speak to somebody, if you choose to go get help. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, feeling weak is definitely part of it. and But a huge part I know for me uh, when I was going through my issues um, and for a lot of guys in the regiment is is the lack of trust right yeah. for the system, yeah, the system. Um, you know in, on the behavioral health side um, or the substance abuse side right um, you're scared to go to behavioral health because maybe there is HIPAA but at the end yeah. of the day you are part of a machine yeah. you know we're yeah. all tools yeah um, so they have to report back, right? So you're always scared for your career um, to be sidelined. Um, and then for the substance abuse, uh, you know, um, for me, like I said, when, when I, everything came to a head, uh, I had had some injuries prior to, and uh, um, I, you start self-medicating. You know, yeah. it's, at first it's to uh, stay on the team, yeah. you know, um, and then uh, it's asleep. You know, yep. it's just, and the more you do it, the further, the darker of a hole you crawl into of isolation, yeah. you know? And um, I felt this, and I knew it wasn't true that, that I was alone. Only yeah. I'm dealing with this, right? Yeah. Only me. No one else is dealing with it. In reality, especially in regiment, like every single one of us are dealing with yeah. it. Yeah. But no one's reaching out, no one's communicating, yeah. no one's asking for help, no one's talking about it um, because of that fear. Yeah. Um, I mean, that fear is, is real a lot of the times, but at the end of the day, if you don't get the help, you know, if you don't help yourself, what does your career matter? Yeah. You know, cause you can't be a good soldier. You can't be a good father. Yeah. You can't do anything. You can't be a good husband. You, yeah. you, you can't do anything. Right. Yeah. Um, so eventually when, when I did go out and get help, I went over to warrior's heart. Okay. Right? So it's in Bandera, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was started by 
um, an ex Delta guy. Yeah. Um, and it was probably the best thing I've done for myself in a long yeah. time. You know, um, they focus on uh, substance abuse and uh, PTSD at the same and uh, traumatic events at the same time, right? Most places where you go um, for help, they will only focus on one or the other. Yeah. And so they take this dual approach um, and is extremely effective because one doesn't coincide, they, they coincide, right? Yeah. You know, the substance abuse is part of the traumatic events, yeah. you know? Like for me, it was a lot of the survivor guilt and a mm -hmm. lot of the, the pain management and it was just, they, they, core, they you know, they were intertwined. Yeah. Um, so going there um, and being detached from the military, mm -hmm. right? Being attached from the DOD, being in a facility that you can feel comfortable that they're there for you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, was was amazing you know yeah um and i wish i had done it sooner yeah. you know because it, it gave me a shot of redemption and mm -hmm. feeling like i hadn't felt in years yeah. you know um so guys have to know that it's better to go sooner than later yeah. you know if yeah. you have to reach out i agree 100 percent. yeah um but yeah so folks i just wanted to again thank ak for coming out and sitting down and speaking with us uh, going forward, uh, this is, you know, something that I like to do. Like, I want to bring guys on to this channel to help uh, this new generation of SF dudes understand not only what they're getting themselves into, but also help them become the best Green Beret that they can. Uh, so going forward, AK is going to be doing some things on the channel with me, whether it's um, us hitting the range together, uh, going over Green Beret marksmanship, or us just sitting down just like we are now and just talking about a certain topic. Um, so uh, give him feedback, let him know how he's doing. Um, and again, I appreciate you guys tuning in. And AK, I appreciate you coming out, man. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yep. Yeah, so um, 